Okay, so let's let's start. Um, if I find the thing to pass, okay, I'll do it from here. So as I was saying, we talk about the intersection between data and design. So first of all, I wanted to share with you uh, a couple of facts. There are so many facts on artificial intelligence now on the news and everywhere, but there are two of them that to me, uh, they caught my attention because I think they show well uh, the truth that we still have uh, um, a way ahead uh, to make these systems work uh, really well and especially really well for humans. So one of them is this very famous quote by Pedro Domingos. This book uh, was, I think it's been for, out for more three years or more, it's very good, I recommend it. And he says that people worry that computers will get too smart and take over the world, but the real problem is that they are too stupid and they have already taken over the world. Okay, so this, uh, I'm not gonna enter into, into the whole philosophy of this phrase, but I want to uh, point out the fact that he's showing us that maybe we are focusing on the wrong direction where we, when we're looking at the problems uh, that AI could bring, okay? Second, which I think is uh, kind of funny, is uh, the fact that whenever we are on the internet, we need to prove all the time to other machines that we are not machines. So, I mean, it's kind of funny because it's like they were doing a Turing test, reverse Turing test to us all the time, so we prove that we are humans. And here the point is not that much uh, that the systems don't trust us. The thing is that the systems don't trust other machines that could be manipulating them. Okay, so here the, the learning for me is more like, okay, are we setting the AI systems with the right goals? Hmm? If we have to do this kind of stuff to prove that we are humans, are we on the right goals? So. With all this, and I could, con I could go on with other examples, no? but with, with all this, I, if in trying to go to the, to the center of the problem here is that whenever we are developing this type of machine learning of, or AI systems, the core of the thing to me is that we are jumping from a, from a concept that was, a, you know, the way we developed a digital products in the past that was more related to how we do human-computer interaction. So we have software programs that perform well for certain tasks, and we have, we have humans using them, and then they work, and that's it. And then we're jumping to a complete new concept, which is human-computer relationship. And this means that we are interacting with systems that learn from us, that learn from the environment, and that adapt to that. Okay? And this is really, really powerful, but it's also really risky, because we don't know always how this is going to develop. And also, it opens the door to, uh, for instance, very, very personalized services. And whenever you get personal, uh, the potential to fail is uh, even bigger. So I wanted to, to share with you a few ideas on these three concepts here, human-centered design, co-evolution, and design for trust, that are very much interrelated uh, between them. I mean, there are a lot of uh, overlappings, uh, but this is the way it's, it works for me to, to share it with you. Okay, so we will start with human-centered design. This is something that uh, is pretty old already, is the whole idea of how we design things that are really focused on humans, but at the same time work uh, uh, in real life. No? So IDEO, the famous uh, design company from the uh, Valley, uh, came up with this concept of uh, where, where, where is innovation? Innovation, uh, viable and sustainable innovation. No? And this is, uh, the idea is that it's in the middle of these three uh, concepts, desirability, so human perspective, this is something that humans want. Feasibility, so is this technically possible? And then uh, viability, so is it something that will, I mean, be sustainable from a business perspective? So in the middle of this, innovation happens. And IDEO, were, they were very good explaining us why we should always start by the human need. Okay, and then create a process, an iterative process, no? until we find this sweet spot of innovation. Okay, this, this iteration is always very summarizing these two concepts of first, we you speculate, second, you critique, then you speculate, then you critique, and then you continue until you come up with something that is uh, worth it. Okay, so my point here is that whenever we are, I mean, this is completely valid and I agree with this, but my point is that whenever you have a machine learning in the loop, you need to start in a different place, and this place is the intersection between design and data science. Why is this? It's because data and data science is, just, is not just a way to make an idea possible. Data can be the idea itself. So I think it's very, very powerful if we have these two perspectives, which are, are very different disciplines, very different mindsets, that, but that put together, I think, uh, are the way to create good products. And, this, and I think this is behind many of the very successful digital products based on machine learning that we uh, see on the market. So one example of this 
is, for instance, this, uh, you probably know this, uh, some of you will know this product uh, from Spotify, Discover Weekly. Any, anybody using Spotify that knows Discover Weekly? Okay, so as, as you, some of you know, this is a, a, a feature or, or a product within Spotify that discovers you music that you might like, but that you don't know yet, or you haven't listened yet. And this is based on the, everything that you listened uh, during the previous week. So the way I imagine that this was created is that, first of all, somebody look at the data and say, hmm, we have, a, I don't know, today they have a, around 85 million paying customers. We have enough data to think of this idea of making people discover stuff. OK, so let's try to do it. So they created an algorithm. And then whenever they had something that worked, then probably they sat with a designer who came up with this idea of, OK, should we just throw a lot of new stuff to people? Should we put it per, during the music they've listened during their whole life? And probably they came up with this idea, of, oh, let's do it for a week, for past week, and let's see if it works. So they put it on, on an experience. They designed an experience to surround this algorithm. And then they put it on the market. And then they start seeing if people use it, how much they use it, if the songs they are recommended, uh, they listen to them to the end, they add them to the favorite list or not. And then they fine tune the algorithm, the experience, until they find something uh, that really works. And then from this idea, they created other products that are not that much based on last week. They are based on the different genders uh, that you listen to. So I'm sure that behind this type of products and behind mm, the Netflix uh, 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 dashboard, when you get into Netflix, those are products that are designed with data science and design in the same room. This is my hypothesis. Okay, so. My whole point here is that we live in a world where basically all the digital services or many digital services are, have one single goal, which is our attention. So all the internet services that are based on advertising, their main goal is to focus our attention on them. Okay? So we think that uh, this should be complementary with focusing on some human goals at the same time. So I'll, I'll show you some examples now, but we can design for discovery as Spotify did. Spotify wants us to be in front of the application, of course, but they are helping us discover new stuff, which is useful for us. We can design for uncertainty and for decision making. We can design for awareness, for time well spent, for peace of mind, to remove friction from our lives, and also to save. Okay? And this is a post that I strongly recommend. It was written by, by my friend uh, Fabian Girardin uh, some time ago, but I think it's very, very, you know, very, still very valuable, the concepts explained there, because I don't see that much of this happening uh, at the company level, except of the big uh, internet giants. Okay, so some examples of this, uh, I mean, this is just randomly picked, no? but for instance, we have these thermostates uh, that learn from your, uh, the way you, you interact with your house and with your uh, heating system and will uh, create a, a model so it adapts uh, and it turns on, on and off uh, whenever they save more. Okay, given the, the way you, you, you live in your house. We have also Kayak, the travel portal, where they have this small, in green there, these small uh, pieces of information letting you know if the price is supposed to go up or down. So they give you the probability of the price of the ticket that you're about to buy, to buy might go up or down. So they give you information in an uncertainty moment, so you make a better choice. Of course, we have Amazon Go, you know, uh, probably well, this shop that you just go out without going to any cashier to pay. Everything happens with cameras that are you know, uh, looking at you and, and taking uh, all the information on what you are purchasing. Then we also have Google Clips, which still is to be seen if it's as useful as they claim. This is a camera that is supposed to solve this problem of you whenever you are in an important moment. Like, for instance, if you, are, if you have kids, you have probably experienced the fact that you always look at your kids when they are at school and a performance or whatever. You see your kids through the screen. You don't see them in real life. I mean, you're missing the very, very big moment because you are just looking through the screen. No? So with this camera, you, put, you place it somewhere. You train the camera to find the person that you are interested in. And, and the camera will take care of taking the good pictures. Okay? This is still to be seen. Then we have, for instance, this uh, feature from uh, Capital One, the American bank, uh, that to me is, some, is a good example of peace of mind. Because they send you an email with any suspicious activity on your card, and you just have to say, no, no, everything is OK by pressing the blue button. But if you don't recognize any of the charges or you are not sure, you just click the red one, and they will take care of everything. So to me, that gives you reassurance and peace of mind. And then you can, of course, design for awareness like this funny uh, data detox uh, kit. 
what, that uh, helps you with different, you know, recommendations and apps to get a detox treatment from data to understand really what is going on with your data online and to help you get uh, less dependent on certain applications. So just a few examples. Second uh, area, which I think is key, is co-evolution. So where systems and humans learn from each other. Call Gerardo. Name unknown. Call Gerardo. Name unknown. Call Gerardo. Calling Gerardo. Hello? Hey, Gerardo. Did you call? Yeah, uh, I was still on the coffee. Yeah, I will um, be there. I'm not even a little late, but we'll be there by here. Okay. Where are you? Oh. Call landed. Call Gerardo. Call Gerardo. Hello? Hey, Gerardo. Sorry, I accidentally hung up. That's fine. So are we meeting at Howard Park? Yeah, let's meet in like half an hour. Okay, be here. Bye. Call ended. Okay, so you see how she learns how to interact with the machine, so it works. Okay, so it goes in both uh, senses. Uh, so this coevolution is probably more important than we uh, are thinking of at the moment. Uh, and here, uh, the things or the tasks that we from the product development side should take into consideration is that, of course, we need to understand humans and we need to work there. But we need also to help humans understand how the machine uh, works. No? So a couple of ideas here, and there are many, many things. We could spend you know, a full day talking about this. But uh, to understand you humans, you have to set up uh, systems. And the, the product that you develop is not something that uh, begins and ends, and then you put it in the market and you forget. You have to continuously test and learn. And a machine learning product is a product that is never finished. And this is something not that easy to understand in certain areas of big organizations, because they are more used to have product development here, then operations here, and completely separated. And in machine learning products, it's just basically don't work. Then, of course, we need to keep on uh, the, per the feedback loop permanently open, both uh, implicit feedback, so looking at the data and looking at how people use the products, as people from Spotify did when they created uh, Discover Weekly, uh, and also the explicit feedback. So, you know, take advantage of specific moments where we can ask people if the things they are uh, using is, are really useful for them or not. Uh, and then something that might seem uh, a little bit more technical on the algorithm performance, but understanding the, uh, you know, the trade-off between coverage and recall is also very important. No? Because sometimes I've been in front of uh, some business areas that ask you, okay, but your predictive algorithm, what is the error rate? And then I ask, okay, but what do you want to use it for? No, no, but what is the error rate? No, what, depends on how you are going to use it, depends what, the, what is the coverage that you want. If you want it for six million people, maybe the, uh, the, the precision will be different than you, if you want it only for 100,000. 100, no? So it's important here. And then, in the helping humans understand the machines, a few ideas here is to be more clear with uh, your goal. So explain what you are trying to achieve and how are you measuring what you are trying to achieve, which is uh, normally quite... Uh, quite uh, hidden today in the products, then uh, we need to launch progressive functionality so we don't go to the most sophisticated feature from the very beginning because as in any other uh, aspect of life, trust takes time. So we are not going to be able to jump from a situation where we're just, for instance, trying to sell people stuff. We're not going to jump to a chatbot that uh, the person is going to trust 100%. No, we need to go step by step and, uh, you know, evolve functionality as we are creating this trust. No? Uh, be careful with over-humanization. I think this is also dangerous, and we are seeing many systems that are trying to mimic uh, humans, and I think that uh, might, this might give the impression to people that they are humans, not only in the way they interact, because, for instance, now Alexa is great in interaction, uh, but it's not great in reasoning. So we can mm, confuse people because they will think that if they interact so well as humans, they will think and reason as well as we do. And they don't. No? They, this will take time. And then try to explain how things work. You know? I think this might be uh, challenging, but uh, I don't see much uh, of explanations there on how recommendation system works, for instance. No? And in this uh, mm, show how it works, I like very much this example. Yeah, maybe you, some of you know. It's called Teachable Machine. It's a website where you can just understand how machine learning works by training a system with your face. 
So you can do in gestures and put in different faces. You can train the system. And whenever I do like this, then uh, some picture of a little cat or a sound will appear. So uh, you can train yourself the system, as, as you can see here with this uh, lady. Very, very funny, very interesting. This works really well with kids, for instance. I tried it myself with my kids. And then last, um, this is something uh, I have to confess that I bought an Alexa 10 days ago when it came out uh, in Spanish. And I was trying to find, after a few hours, I, tried, I was trying to find funny stuff to do with Alexa uh, for my kids. Uh, and then I, this video came out, uh, and I, I couldn't help sharing it with you today. So. Yeah. Play Tinker Tinker. Lata, play Tinker Tinker. Bobby, can you talk to play wheels? You want to box? hear a station for porn detected. Porno ringtone, no. hot chick, amateur girl, quiet, no. sexy. No, 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 no. no. Pussy oh. anal dildo ringtone. Alexa, girl. stop. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I didn't show my kids this one. I, I know what to do now. Uh, but yeah, you know, we need to learn how to interact with these systems so, so they can work in our benefit. Last uh, of the three topics is design for trust. No, we've been talking about trust a little bit uh, uh, before, but here, uh, the point here is that it's not just trusting on the fact that the thing will work and that the thing will be secure, will be safe. It's the trust that you need to have on something, on somebody, that is working on your benefit. And it, that it doesn't have any hidden goal that I cannot see, but that, that it might damage me uh, eventually. Okay, so how can we make these systems so they are trusted uh, by people because we've seen so many cases now on the news, maybe too many, no? uh, compared to the real applications of AI, where, where in many cases they are being very, very good and very efficient. No? But this uh, is, is happening. No? So even with very good intentions, it's not that we are uh, very bad people there. No, it's people that have good intentions, uh, but we find data-driven systems that can violate privacy, that can, can, have negative, uh, that can do negative profiling, can limit access to goods, uh, can reduce the quality of life of people, and, and very importantly, can destroy trust uh, and brand equity. No? We've seen uh, in many situations also. No? So the point here for me is that, uh, okay, let's, let's try to see what is the, this matrix between uh, algorithm intention here in the vertical and the, and the result no, of your intentions. And, and by the way, this is a two by two matrix where I try to explain everything with this type of matrices. Uh, because I think that if you cannot explain something in two by two, then it's too complex, no? So it doesn't, it's not worth it. So uh, if, if the world was this simple, no, we could say, okay, if we have good intention, good res result, we are okay. Let's continue with the product, no? Or with the system. If we have bad intentions and the result is bad, then we will catch the guy, no? So it goes to jail, no problem, no? If we have good intentions, but, but the result is bad, and we've seen many cases uh, like this, we can work on certain aspects, like for instance, work on the data, if, it bias, if it's biased or not. I'm not saying this is easy, but we, we have something to do. We can work on the statistics, on the maths that we've developed. We can work on the implementation, because sometimes it's not the math, it's not the data, it's the implementation. Uh, or the unexpected usages of the different technologies, as, as uh, famously happened in the case of the chatbot from uh, Microsoft if you remember, Thai. Uh, and then, well, I think that uh, having bad intentions ending up in something good is very, very, very little chance of this uh, happening. No? So the problem is that the world is not this simple. No? And the reality is that things that are purely in one of these four quadrants are very, very little. No? And the, the world is more uh, like in the middle because we have many, many systems that start performing well and then we don't have enough, probably, attention on how they develop, how they learn, so they end up performing wrong or bad. Okay, so here, the uh, world is not simple. I, I was also looking at the Alexa stories uh, last week. I found out one that was, I think, also funny, of a couple that were uh, discussing at home, and then they were talking about a friend. They mentioned the name of the friend, and Alexa called the friend, and the friend heard the whole conversation. Uh, of the couple, no? Uh, so, so these people, the owners of Alexa, complained to Alexa, and then it came to the press and everything. So, it's, this is a case where the intention is pretty good, but at the end, because they try to facilitate when you call people, but uh, it ended uh, badly, no? 
So what can we do here? No? And here we've seen a lot of uh, uh, initiatives lately, which make me very happy, around this idea of uh, responsible data usages and AI responsible usage checklists. Here I just have a couple of uh, ideas. There are many more. And the, probably the most complete uh, piece of work around this is the recently launched uh, Asylum Mar Principles. I think Nuria Oliver uh, talked a little bit about this before. Uh, but basically, of course, you can always, you should always challenge your own math. So don't be, don't be happy with the first result that complies with what you were thinking uh, was okay. Uh, as I said before, and I, I'm repeating myself a lot on this, but we need to permanent test and learn from how the systems perform. We need to look for biases, data biases, of course, but not only data biases, also usage, no? Because if we think of bias, which is very, you know, in fashion now, uh, there's been technological biases all the time, since the very beginning of time, no? For instance, I am left-handed, no? And the scissor is, is a technology that you use to cut, uh, and they are designed for left hand, for right-handed people. So I had to adapt myself during my whole life to things that were designed for uh, right-handed people. Okay. Now with these systems that are digital, if you find this type of minorities, you can try to include them uh, in the way your models work. So it's not only data; it's also the way people use stuff. No. Also, how critical is the problem? So it's not the same to recommend a song as to recommend a pension fund. Okay, it's not, you know, it's not equal, it's very much more important one decision than another, and it's not the same also to recommend a movie than to put an autonomous car uh, on the street. So we need to think of that also. Uh, this question, who are we empowering, is very important, especially when we are uh, deploying systems that uh, have a, a for-profit uh, intention, as m most of them are. No? Uh, so we need to think if we are just empowering the company and the business, and we are empowering the human, uh, or not. And this is, uh, this seems simple, but it's not always the answer is not always yes. No. Uh, one very funny thing that we like to do a, a lot also is to, to try to think of what is the worst thing you could do with this. No. Because at the end of the day, we are de developing tools, and tools have always two sides. No. It can be used for the good or for the bad. And I mean, these systems are especially powerful in this in this field. No. And uh, last, and I could continue, no? if, if the variables that the algorithm is using, are they actionable for the subject? Okay, whenever we are deciding something for somebody, can people uh, you know, action on those, on those variables anyhow? So for instance, if you come for a loan and you are of whatever race, and I say no, can you action on your race? Uh, so these type of questions. So four fields of uh, uh, research that we are developing at the moment at uh, BBVA uh, on this uh, idea of trust is uh, fairness uh, and everything related especially to uh, dynamic pricing and uh, uh, unfair discrimination through pricing and how we can implement dynamic pricing models that take into consideration fairness uh, concepts. Second is also diversity, uh, and this is about uh, this idea of uh, being much more easy to uh, recommend things to people that are uh, on the line of what they have already uh, consumed in the past. No, uh, this is very, 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 you know, visible in YouTube. No, if you enter into a YouTube video, they will try to offer you something that is related to what you've seen, but maybe a little bit more, you know, extreme in what, whatever uh, field you are uh, watching. No, so at the end of the day, it radicalized a little bit your opinion, the way you use, you use stuff, etc. So you can introduce in the algorithms diversity uh, uh, so, so people you know, can be more open depending on the field. Now, for instance, when, when we can recommend people where to buy with their credit card next, we can do it for the, okay, go to Sara or to El Corte Inglés, so you will, the algorithm will perform well, but if we want people to discover small shops, maybe we should manually introduce these other uh, options. No? Then transparency, and this is related basically to the goals of the systems. How transparent are we uh, when we deploy these systems? Uh, why are we doing them? What are they trying to optimize? Uh, and last, and I, I know that we could talk a lot uh, about this, uh, but we don't have much time, interpretability. No? Uh, try to understand uh, okay, how this thing is working. How is it deciding? And this is especially uh, important in deep learning systems. Uh, and by the way, I didn't mention, but uh, if you are interested on this topic of uh, human-centered AI and designs, uh, designers and data scientists working together, there is a talk later today at four, I think, by my colleagues Marcelo Soria and Alex Vidal from BBVA Data and Analytics that will give a much, you know, detailed and deeper uh, talk on the on the topic. Uh, this is just a paper that we released uh, 
a couple of months ago on, on this topic of reinforcement learning uh, for fair dynamic pricing. If you are interested on the topic, you, I recommend you to have a look at this. So in BBVA, we are trying to apply these uh, concepts. Uh, of course, we are learning. No, we, we don't master this, uh, not at all, but we are trying to do stuff that goes in this line. No? And I think I'm going to show you some examples that I think prove that we really build that all this that I've said, I think it's clear that we believe on, on it. So, so the way we uh, I like to show that things that we do on AI uh, within BBVA is everything that goes below the glass in the operational world, everything related to automation, efficiency, internal decision making, everything that happens inside the company, and then what happens uh, above the glass no? uh, with customer facing applications. And here we're talking about improved experiences, personalization, making this at scale uh, and being relevant for people. OK, so I'll show you a couple of examples. And then if you have questions, I'll, I'll be happy to, to answer. So first of all, for, for uh, individuals, we have all this idea, all, all this concept around financial advisory, automatic financial advisory. And here we started a, a few years ago already with a, a problem that might seem simple, uh, but it's not, and it's very, very basic to start to build uh, other more sophisticated stuff, which is the automatic categorization of transactions. So the idea here is that you, and this is mainstream now, uh, I know, but what is not mainstream is 100% accuracy here. No? So the idea is that whatever uh, transaction that comes into your account or your card, it gets automatic automatically categorized into something that is understandable for you. And once you have that, you can start playing around with uh, you know, understanding if you have been spending more money on gas than last year, also having uh, goals or having uh, alerts. Whenever I spend on bars more than, I don't know, whatever euros per month, I get an alert, etc. No? So this is like the first step. Once you have that, we have things like, for instance, this. All this is, for, by the way, live uh, on the BBVA apps. This is a, a comparison engine. So here what you can do is to compare yourself with other people like you. No? And this like you is something that you can modulate, for instance your uh, same level of income, your city and, and zip code, your age, your gender. You compare yourself with other people and how other people spend in different categories compared to yourself. And the funny part here, or the interesting part, is that you can also simulate yourself in other cities. Okay, so I can put somebody like me, but that lives in whatever, Valencia. Uh, and you can compare if, if they spend or how they spend compared to you, if you are thinking of moving to another city. Another thing that we can do once we have the things categorized is this type of uh, financial health uh, indexes. Uh, so here, we analyze the transactions. We see how many fixed costs, variable costs, and income people have. So we uh, can tell them, look, your financial health is whatever number, and, and you are evolving this or that uh, direction. And the most important part, we can give recommendations to people to you know, have a more health, healthier uh, cost and income uh, structure. No? This one is a set of apps that we are uh, going to launch. This is already live, uh, more vertical, thinking of a specific uh, life event. So here taking all these uh, categories and, and transactions and comparing that with uh, how much is it, is it to have a baby. Uh, so we try to recommend people if, if they're going to do well or not and how much they're going to they're have to spend when the happy moment uh, comes. Then. Apart from having a lot of analysis from the current transactions, we can also take a step uh, no, further and, and try to forecast what is going to happen in the people's account before things happen. No? And here, is, this is already live for, it's been live for more than a year ago now. So what we have here is the capacity to uh, put in a calendar what is going to happen in your account two months before it happens. Okay? So it's not just that we uh, forecast your electricity bill uh, in whatever month, which we do, and we take into consideration your pattern over the past two years, or that we know that your mortgage payment, which is very easy to infer, will happen on the fifth and it will be that this amount of money. We also do it uh, with the transactions that we cannot say the day, the specific day, but we can forecast the end of month uh, total expenditure. No? So for instance, uh, supermarkets, cash withdrawals, dinners out, or whatever we can uh, try to, and we, I mean, it, the accuracy is quite, uh, quite, quite high. We can try to say, OK, by the end of the month, this is our prediction for you this month. No? And here, the important part is not that much to good, make a good prediction and do, do always right. It's the fact that whenever the prediction doesn't match the reality, there's something that happened there. Okay? And we are working now on a set of alerts. 
and messages to let people know whenever things didn't go as they were expected. Because maybe your water bill uh, came twice as big as it should have because there is something wrong in your, in your installation at home or whatever. Maybe it's OK, and then right. But if it's not, uh, I mean, today nobody, nobody is sending me alerts whenever I have an, a, a non-typical uh, behavior in whatever utility. No? Uh, another application is, uh, this has been also out for, for a couple of years now. And, and this idea is whenever you're going to buy a house, we give you the opportunity to see the price of any house of Spain even though it's not a, a, at sale at the moment. No? This is BBVA Valora. And what we have introduced um, a couple of months ago is, is this augmented reality capacity. So you can walk on the street, you can look at the uh, buildings, and then if there is something that is on sale, it will appear. But you can also click on a building and find out the price of this specific house uh, that you are seeing in front of you. So. This, uh, this functionality, this set of functionality that we are trying to evolve much further to make it much more actionable than it is today, is behind uh, this, which I feel proud of, is this success of uh, BBVA having been uh, appointed as the best mobile banking app in the world by Forrester two years in a row. Uh, and something that we are trying to do now is, of course, grow uh, functionality, but also make it more adaptive make the interface more adaptive to the different usages that people uh, might have. Because if I am not looking for a house, maybe I don't need to have Valora uh, in, my, in my dashboards, no? for instance. And this is, again, a place where design and machine learning uh, have to work together to make these uh, interfaces more, adapted, much more adapted to each and every person. We also have some applications for not only for people, but also for businesses. This application, Commerce360, uh, is based on the payments data and helps the retailers understand how they are doing compared to their context uh, in their neighborhood. So you have this type of metrics where you see, OK, your competitors in your area are selling a lot on Sundays, and you are do not doing that well. Something is happening because people are coming. You are not selling. Uh, where people come from, this classical question from the IKEAs of the world that asks you your zip code when you go out. This is something that we can calculate for everybody, for every type of uh, retailer with the credit card information. By the way, this, of course, is anonymized, uh, aggregated information. Uh, yeah, well, we have some translation to natural language of all these graphs, because a lot of retailers don't like the numbers, so they prefer to read. Uh, and it's a more gently way to get into these type of apps. And also, we've launched, I think last week or two weeks ago, this uh, idea of aggregating uh, uh, companies' information from different banks in one single uh, place. And not only that, is that this way we aggregate is already compliant with the, with the Plan General Contable, with the official uh, accountancy that, you, that, the, that the company has to, to make. Um, so last, uh, a little add on our website, uh, where we have a lot of information on what we, I have explained and the things that we do, and a lot of papers all, also. Uh, so visit uh, our blog, bbbadata.com, uh, if you are interested. I think this is it. Yeah, so thank you so much. And thank you for being here at three. Okay. Thanks to you, because it's been a pleasure, Elena. And it's time for the question. Many questions. Mm, I'm not sure if I want you to make them, but OK. <laughs> if no question, I can make questions. OK, any questions from you? He's saying, please, please make questions. You please, go. please. It's your time. After the two of a spade, you deserve her a question. And you are the one okay. who make always questions. So. Or maybe it's not you yet. Oh. Anyone? Any question? Three, two, one. What do you going to think that is going to be the future for your bank and for all the information that you, in future, what's going to happen from five years or to 10 years? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I've learned, not, I, I've learned from working in prediction that I shouldn't make predictions like that. But I can tell you what we want to happen, uh, yes. and kind um, of in, my, in banking at least. If you can answer me in two ways, what the banker, what the bank one that happens, and what you suppose by yourself that happened. What will happen and what I no, think. No, that's it. 
<laughs> what no. the bank want they, and they what match, you want. They match. Ah, okay, great. <laughs> okay, so, um, I mean, I think if, if you've seen the applications that we have been developing, yes. we are going to continue in that line, trying to make things much more useful and much more meaningful for people. And take uh, the financial products have been very, very close to the financial world, uh, yes. not that much to people's lives. No? So whenever you need a, a mortgage, we just take care of the mortgage and we don't care much about you changing homes, all the things that you have to take care of, uh, what happens after is just, no, we sell the product and bye-bye, no? So we try to, yeah, I mean, at the end, money is behind everything and we have products that help you, you know, move moving, uh, money around, have money whenever you need it, yes. but it's not close to what happens with the money. Uh, he okay. knows, he has 10 euros for free. <laughs> he make with the 10 euros yeah. and that's for free. So that is from, from one side. And, and then another thing that we, we would like to do better also is to introduce, uh, similar to the concept of uh, self-driven uh, cars, yes. autonomous driving, we think that uh, autonomous banking can happen in certain fields. Whenever we, we get a, a, some more trust from people, some stuff that is really boring from financing, taking control, taking bills and everything, I think or we think all that could be automated uh, and give people more time instead of getting people more, uh, more attention. Great. Thank you for solving me the question. Any other question? Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. Big applause for her. Big applause for Elena. Thank you so much. <laughs>